Hi everyone, I'm Emily Webb and I'm your chair for this evening. I'm co-host of Australian True Crime podcast and host of the fairly new podcast, Crime Fiction Friday, where I've already had some great conversations with authors who are part of Sisters in Crime. I've written some true crime books too, including Angels of Death about healthcare serial killers. That's published by Clandestine Press. Sisters in Crime Australia is delighted to welcome you to our February event, The Innocents, Child Victims, brought to you and the world through the miracle of Zoom. We had hoped that we might be holding in-person events again, but Zoom means we can involve authors from right across Australia. Tonight, authors Carolyn Overington, Catherine Kovacic and Stella Bedrikas will be talking to me for about 35 minutes about how and why children who our society professes to love and cherish too often become victims of violence and abuse, unable to defend themselves or even speak out. At the outset, on behalf of Sisters in Crime Australia, we acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. Now, let me introduce the panel. Sydney author Carolyn Overington is a two-time winner of the Walkley Award for Investigative Journalism and a winner of the Sir Keith Murdoch Award for Excellence in Journalism. She's very talented. She has written 13 books, including Last Woman Hanged, which actually won the 2016 David Award for Best Nonfiction Crime Book. Her latest book is Missing William Tyrrell. That's published by HarperCollins Publications. It's a true crime examination of the ongoing investigation into the disappearance of a little boy in a Spider-Man suit from the village of Kendall, New South Wales in 2014. And all of us know that photo. Caroline is Associate Editor of The Australian. Welcome, Caroline. Thank you for having me. Now, Catherine Kovacic is, hails from Melbourne and is a writer, art historian and former veterinarian. Her debut novel, The Portrait of Molly Dean, was shortlisted for the 2019 Ned Kelly Award for Best First Fiction. It's the first of three books in the Alex Clayton Art Mystery Series. Her new true crime novel is The Schoolgirl Strangler, published by Echo, and tells the shocking story of a serial killer targeting young girls in 1930s Melbourne. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Emily. Lovely to be here. And now we have Stella Bedrikas, who has worked as a general practitioner and addictions clinic doctor, pastoral carer and a freelance writer in Perth. Her second book, The Edward Street Baby Farm, published by Fremantle Press, focuses on Perth woman Alice Mitchell, who was arrested in 1907 for the murder of a five-month-old baby. The state was horrified to learn that at least 37 infants had died in her care during the previous six years. The trial gripped the nation and led to legislative changes to protect children's welfare. Welcome, Stella. Thank you, Emily. It's good to be here. Now, first of all, I want to ask you all what it was that drew you to the particular cases that you wrote about. I'll start with Stella. Can you tell us how you came to write your book? Back in 2017, I just finished writing a book about my great-great-grandmother who was a single mother and during my research for that, I discovered the term baby farming, which refers to people who take in children for single mothers for a profit rather than for any consideration for the children's welfare. And when I finished that book, I decided to look into the phrase a bit more. And the first, almost the first story that came up was the one of Alice Mitchell, which I was quite startled to find because she was a local, I mean, she li lived walking distance from where I live and yet I'd never heard of it before. So I began digging into it and that was the beginning of the book. <laughs> Thanks, Stella. Now, Catherine, tell us how you came to write your book. I came across this case or these cases when I was actually researching um, a crime fiction book which had a setting in 1930s Melbourne. And so I was doing the background research and looking at, at crime and policing at the time. And I came across these murders and these victims and it... I hadn't really realised actually how much the case has stuck with me because I'd sort of put it aside because it was really just background research at the time. And then about probably nearly three years later, my publisher actually said, had, had I ever thought of writing a true crime book? And I said, well, no, actually, but there is this case. And I basically, we were on a tram at the time and I gave her like the, a pitch 
and, and it was sort of a five minute pitch for a book that I didn't know I was going to pitch, let alone write. But I had the names of these victims and their ages and the exact dates when they were murdered. And that was when it really hit me how much this case had had an impact on me, even when I just kind of read about it in the periphery. So I, that was when I really decided that it was a story that needed to be told. Thanks, Catherine. Now, Caroline, tell us about why you wrote Missing William Tyrrell. Well, I'll be honest with you, and, and I'll say that I wasn't going to. I really didn't want to. Um, and the reason I didn't want to is for a well, quite specific reason that he's still missing. Um, he's a three-year-old boy. He went missing in 2014, and he's still missing. And I was very worried about my motivation. I was worried about, was I going to just be writing a true crime book about a child when this is a real boy? I mean, this is not entertainment. This is not you know, everybody jumping on the true crime bandwagon and saying, you know, how fascinating this is and what great entertainment this is. This is a real child and he's still missing. And so I really had to examine myself very closely and ask, why are you doing this? And if you're doing it because you just think, well, that will be a popular book or that will entertain people, then you're doing it for the, entirely the wrong reasons. So what would be a good reason to write the book? And I thought to myself, do I believe that the crime is solvable. And I do. I believe the crime can be solved. And I believe that we can find out what happened to him and that mistakes were obviously made in the investigation, but they can be corrected. And that if we go back and we look at everything that we know and we talk to everyone that we need to talk to, there is a possibility that we will find out what happened to William. And that seemed to me to be a legitimate motivation to write the book. Thanks, Caroline. So following on from what we've just spoken about, all the cases you've all written about were ones that, you know, of the day shocked the public. You write about a contemporary case, Caroline, and Stella and Catherine, you write about more historical cases. So while doing research, I want to hear from you about what was the sense that you got about the coverage of these crimes and the reaction of the public at the time and, I guess, the attachment they had to the case. I'll start with you, Catherine. These cases from the very first murder had Australia-wide coverage. It was the first murder happened in 1930. And this was a 12-year-old girl who disappeared from the park. She was there playing with her sisters. And she went away with this man. The sisters went with them for a while and then she was gone and her body was found the next day. So certainly the, the Melbourne public was immediately horrified, but it was right around Australia. This was a shocking crime. This was a time when and we do tend to think of the past through rose-coloured glasses that it was safer and, a, you know, kind of gentle. And it seems to have been the case, you know, that you could send a 12-year-old as the responsible party to the park, which was probably about a 10 or 15-minute walk from these children's home and, um, and expect them to come home at the end of the day, a Saturday afternoon. And so it, I think it was a real shock to the public that, that this had happened, that this was a, a stranger. You know, we know about stranger danger now, but it was a respect your elders time. Um, so it was horrifying. And then when we had the second murder, and the second murder was only eight weeks after the first. And I think that was frightening for the public, frightening for the police, I think, too, because this was, this was a whole new thing for them to deal with, the idea of, of someone who, who didn't fit into that paradigm of, of what they were used to investigating, someone who was just seemingly randomly killing. So it was, it was fear and there was shock. But certainly from the very get-go, the newspapers and the public, there was, there was outrage and there was, what are the police doing? Why hasn't this been solved yet? Why has this happened? There were even calls for, to ban men from sitting alone on park benches after the first murder. That's how frightened the public became. Thanks, Catherine. Stella, what about you? What was the public's reaction to the case of the baby farmer that you wrote about? Soon after she was arrested, the newspapers published uh, the story that she had been arrested because there had been rumours in the newspapers earlier that there was a baby farm in East Perth, but nobody had been named. And suddenly now there was concrete evidence that there was a baby farm there. Um, once the trial, or once the, before the trial, there was a, a coroner's court case, and that was when it began to become evident just how many babies had died. And it, it immediately became sort of news across the nation. 
and people flocked to the courts to listen to what was going on. I think the fact that Alice Mitchell was associated with local pioneer families, she was a local rather than someone who'd come in from somewhere else, sort of heightened people's interest in the case. And the newspapers began publishing lots of stories with um, very sensational headlines, which sort of heightened people's awareness of it. Yeah, like the newspapers back then are like the podcasts of today. You know, um, people think that people are only interested in true crime now, but really newspapers would serialise court cases um, mm. back in the day and it was, you know, people would flock to get their newspapers into the court cases. Um, Caroline, you, of course, write about William Tyrrell and I know from experience with, you know, doing a true crime podcast that people feel very passionate about this case. They have a lot of theories and opinions and we've often been asked about what we think happened, what we know happened. I mean, I don't know more any more than what has been reported or what you've written about. So what was it, I guess, like for you writing about this, knowing the, the public appetite for knowledge about this case? Well, you know, that's really what I see the enormous value in books like Stella's book and Catherine's book and also in your podcast, because we can really see the way somebody is coming along sometime in the future to judge me and somebody is coming along to judge all journalists who are covering this case. Um, and therefore, we have to be very careful because we don't want to be in a position where a historian sometime down the track can say, you know, they blew it out of all proportion or they made it um, sensational, they blamed the wrong people, they ruined people's lives. But certainly that accusation has been made about journalists who have covered this case, that there have been a number of people who are considered suspects or persons of interest whose lives have been destroyed by the media. And it's because historians and authors like Catherine and Stella and yourself come along later that we know that this has an ongoing impact on people's lives. Um, I'm always very conscious when I'm covering William's case of keeping in mind that these people are still alive. This is not a historical case. William has a 10 year old sister who goes to school in the same city that I live in. And he has two sets of parents who live in the same city as me. And so I'm always very conscious of trying to be extremely accurate in the reporting that we do. And also bearing in mind that it is not a historical case. This is not something we're writing about a hundred years down the track. Whatever I write has a real impact on people today. And I feel that responsibility when I cover it. And, you know, writing about these kind of cases, especially with children involved, um, there's sensitivities that you have to bear in mind. And obviously there are some differences to how Caroline writes about a contemporary case to how Catherine and Stella write about historical cases. But nonetheless, there's considerations. Stella, what was in your mind when you were writing about this case and about I guess, how you wanted to convey the gravity of the crime, you know, not sensationalise it, even though it was actually it's such a shocking case. How did you approach the writing process for that? I had read accounts of this case um, in books about true crime, which only covered the, the trial itself, and they, they did sort of sensationalise it. And what I wanted to do was to look more about how it had come about and who the people were who were involved and what happened to them and what happened as a result of the trial. So I wanted to write a much bigger picture than just his 37 dead babies. And I think it was helpful that it was 100 years ago because I was aware that none of these people that I was writing about were alive anymore. I and mean, I understand what Caroline's saying there. That's a lot of a lot of families affected that's mm. unbelievable actually when mm. I was reading your book I couldn't believe it that's it's shocking and I think you can gloss over I know when I've researched things I've seen the term baby farm and I haven't really investigated it I've just thought oh I kind of know what that is but it is absolutely shocking so mm. I think that um you writing that's about that's really important probably more aware that the people I was writing about have descendants still living in Perth and because the story has been forgotten, was it appropriate to dig it up and bring it back to memory again? Mm -hmm. I had to think about that before I started writing. Yeah, they're all considerations to take on board um, as writers, especially with the spotlight on the true crime genre more than anything ever before. Catherine, how did you approach 
your writing process with thinking about how you were going to convey the the shock and and it's a you know it's a serial killer case people are very interested in it but you want to deal with it as sensitively as possible absolutely so I my first thing was that I wanted to to keep the victims front and center I mean you can't write a book about a serial killer without talking about the serial killer you know a great deal but I wanted readers to come away remembering the girls and their names as much if not more than they remembered the killer's name I sort of think about it almost in the way that everyone in Australia knows the name Ned Kelly but if you said what were the names of the three police officers that he killed at Stringy Bark Creek I think there'd be a lot of people who'd be hard pressed to give you the answer to that so I wanted people to come away remembering the girls because that was what I wanted you know I wanted people to sort of have that honor and I spoke to some of the descendants of those families so sort of the the great nephews and nieces um, and it was interesting that you know some of them hadn't even known that they'd had a, a great aunt or an aunt who'd been murdered until the 1960s or 70s until they were sort of adults themselves it was a big family secret so that was another reason to handle it sensitively because they you know it, they have a, a vested interest in the memory of that relative too but I also wanted readers to have the sense of, of how the cases unfolded at the time. So to not know the name of the killer until he was arrested, to have that feeling of, of how the public were reacting, how the police were going about their investigations. And as we were saying earlier, that, that fear and the frustration of trying to, to work out what was going on and to track this person down. So I wanted people to sort of be there in the 1930s, really, and see what, what that was like, both in terms of policing but in terms of that, the cultural shift almost that came about because these girls were being murdered by, by almost an invisible man, you know, someone who could seemingly abduct them in the blink of an eye from very public places, and, and they just disappeared. So it was, and of course, the killer himself had family. He had a wife and child too. And I, I sort of tracked down what had happened to them and they'd, his wife had changed her name immediately. So that was a another sensitivity to bear in mind that he was a whole other family and his brother and their children too, you know, they don't want to be linked back to this case. They distanced themselves from it way back in the 1930s. So that was something else to bear in mind that there's still real people involved in this case, even though we're, you know, 90 plus years on. Um, and those little girls also deserve to be re remembered, you know, for themselves, not just for being the victim, the girl who got murdered. And Caroline, you obviously, you know, you've written about William Tyrrell and there's, you know, everyone's, it's all contemporary. You've got people who have come under the scrutiny as being suspects. You've got the families. And of course, as um, the case unfolded, we actually learned a little bit about William's family circumstances, which added a, another element of complexity to it. How did you manage that in terms of, you know, trying to tell the um, facts and be true to the case and honour William and his family, but also, I don't know, be, be as sensitive as you could so you avoided issues, I guess, is what I'm trying to ask. Well, in some ways I had no choice because I've never come across a, a case quite like this one in terms of suppression orders. There are more suppression orders on this case than I have ever encountered before. There are suppression orders on the suppression orders, if that makes sense. There are some mm. things we can't even tell you are suppressed. Um, a great deal of information was suppressed at the beginning that later on became information that we were able to put into the public realm. So for example, when William first went missing, no one was allowed to know that he was a foster child. And a member of the public, a very brave woman, took that to the Supreme Court. No journalist managed it, um, no. <laughs> but she, she went along and she stood up and she made the case that William should be identified as a foster child, that there was nothing shameful about that. There should be no stigma associated with that. Um, the department had argued that he would, if found, would be stigmatized by the fact that he was a foster child. And the judge said, well, I think his biggest problem, his most pressing problem is not that people will think he's a foster child, but that he's missing and that he needs to be found. And it's far more likely that we will find him the more information we know about what, where he was on the day. And so after that, we were able to say where he was and who he was with and various other things. But there are still a lot about the case that we cannot report. And I know that that frustrates a lot of uh, viewers and a lot of readers um, who, who have published information on the internet that is, mm. that is uh, suppressed. And, and 
I find it frustrating too, but I am not above the law. And I, I don't pretend for a moment that I am above the law. And if the law says that there is a good reason that this information not be made public, well, I will abide by that, even if I don't necessarily agree with it. Yeah, I have, I'm always fascinated to see on different forums online where people just publish stuff. And, I, you know, I've got a journalist background and I always think, yeah, like I'm pretty careful about everything. What's the um, consequences or has there been consequences for people who've posted things on groups or on Facebook in terms of William's case? Yes, there has been a man who has gone to jail for publishing information on Facebook. Um, you can be imprisoned for breaking those suppress, suppress, suppression orders and you can also be fined. Your newspaper company can be fined as well. But to me, that's not really the issue. I'm not, I'm not frightened of going to prison, as it were, um, but, I, but I respect the law. And a judge has decided that, so for example, um, the name of William's sister is suppressed and it's suppressed for a good reason. She's entitled to her privacy. She's 10 years old. And so she's going to school and she has friends and, and it will be her story to tell um, the fact that she is William's sister, will be her story to tell if she chooses to tell it. And we also don't know how much she knows. And so I don't feel it's for me, a complete stranger to her to be uh, publishing her name or the, the place where she goes to school or where she lives. And I know that that kind of information has been made public in the past and there have been penalties um, imposed on people for doing that. And I think rightly so. I think that that information should be suppressed. It's not, that's not a decision for you or I or anyone else um, to make. That's a decision for the family and for the courts. Mm. And Catherine, you know, you wrote about a serial killer and when this case was happening, Police didn't know that this was a serial killer because that term wasn't coined until, you know, the 1960s, 70s, if we've all seen Mindhunter and read, you know, John Douglas's books. What did you learn about the police investigation? Like, I'm really interested to know how police managed this, like this crime. Had they encountered this before? Like, what were some of the things that you discovered in your research? Certainly they made considerable errors in the case but I think we have to remember that it, first of all it was 1930 so we we sort of come from that generation of CSI where we've got blood and DNA and CCTV and you know phone records they had none of that available to them they were they had indigenous trackers for you know if they were out in the country they could take plaster casts of tire tracks and footprints if that sort of thing came along um, they could, well, blood analysis, they could just, just in, you could do O positive, AB negative, but that was as far as it went. Um, and fingerprinting was all fairly new too. So you could take a fingerprint off a solid surface, not off skin. And because it was fairly new, um, most criminals hadn't had their fingerprints taken. So even if this guy had been in the system, chances were he wouldn't have had his fingerprints taken anyway. So they were really relying on, you know, I guess what we would say good old fashioned footwork and knocking on doors and asking questions. But I think they were also really held back. I don't want to say necessarily by their egos, but by the fact that the idea of a serial killer, someone who chose their victims pretty much at random um, and whose motives were obscure was just so far out of the bounds of what they were used to that they really couldn't come up with a way to approach this investigation. You know, the, the people that they were looking at in the first case was an ex-con. In the second one, it was the father, you know, a close male family member. And in the third case, it was a close family friend. So they were really looking for ways to kind of fit these crimes into the boxes that they were used to dealing with. And it wasn't really until the third crime, I think, that they realised they were dealing with something that was just completely different. And they started to to look at things differently and to approach the case differently in the sense that I think they also got afraid too because in one of the third case, they actually questioned over 18,000 people. And to me, that really sort of smacked of a bit of desperation and a bit of we've got, to, we've got to do this now because this guy had reappeared. So I think we have to cut them a bit of slack for what they were facing and the avenues they had for investigation. But at the same time, they were really of the mindset that it was almost certainly with the first case, they decided that this was the guy and then they went about squeezing and massaging the facts to fit their idea that this was the guy and they just did not want to let that go. Mm -hmm. So there was a very double edge to it, but um, a, a, lot, a lot to think about with the policing. Mm. And Stella, 
were baby farms known about when Alice Mitchell was, you know, committing her crimes or were the public, was it something the public didn't really know existed and, and this case kind of blew open the lid on it? What did you discover about that? No, it's a well-known term. In fact, from the 1870s onwards, um, there have been people who took advantage of single mothers' need to find someone to look after the child so that they could earn a living. And there had been some pretty notorious cases, um, both in England and in Sydney and Melbourne. There was the Makin couple in Sydney in the 1890s who'd been discovered after some of the children that they actually murdered were dug up in a backyard where they'd lived. So people were very familiar with the term. So what was it about, um, in particular then, about Alice Mitchell and then what happened subsequently? Because some actual changes were made, weren't they, after this case? Like um, the public and the authorities were obviously outraged under pressure. So what, what, mm. what was it about this case? Well, the existing laws should have prevented what happened. I mean, Alice Mitchell was licensed by the Perth City Council. She was supposed to keep good records of the children that she had in her care. And she was supposed to notify the coroner if children died, but um, she hadn't done that. She handed the children over to the undertakers without notifying the coroner. The undertakers denied that they knew that they were supposed to have a coroner certificate. Um, Harriet Lenehan, who is the female health inspector who visited the house regularly on behalf of Perth City Council, was supposed to have monitored Alice's record keeping and she failed to do anything about what was happening. The doctor, doctor officer who signed two thirds of the death certificates also didn't take responsibility for what was happening. So if the law had been applied as it was meant to be applied, there wouldn't have been so many deaths. But as a result of the trial, the government introduced um, legislation to tighten up on people taking in boarded out, boarded out infants. They introduced trained nurses to supervise them um, and they introduced a children's department and a children's court and it quite changed the infant protection rules in Western Australia. Mm. Yeah, I, I hadn't heard of the case before I read your book and um, it just really struck me that I guess people turn a blind eye or they don't do their jobs properly and look what happens mm. and, you know, that can still happen today. Um, yes. So, yeah, it was definitely, um, as well as the criminal aspect, there was a, the societal aspect of this case that really fascinated me and it's the, the ripple effect, isn't it, of, um, mm. of crimes and, and that's why I think it's really important that these books get written. Um, I like to um, ask people, I, I'm really interested in knowing if when you were writing or now that you've written the book and you've had this immersive experience about the research and the writing about the things that stayed with you, if there was anything in particular that really has stayed in your, your heart or things that you were really surprised or shocked at when you um, were writing the book. Um, Caroline, I'll ask you about about what 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 stays with you about William, or what was it that I don't know. There's an impact, isn't there, on writing about these things? So, what was it for you? Well, they're broken. I mean, his family is broken, and and you're looking at that grief and that trauma um, up close every day. And and many of the people um, who are associated with the case are also broken. Um, you know, William was in foster care, and so he had a caseworker. And the Salvation Army was in charge of his care, so that you have those personnel as well. You have police officers. I mean, some and the people who searched for William. I mean, they can you imagine? They went out there, thinking to themselves, "He was a little boy lost in the bush. We're going to, we're going to march out there, and we're going to find him. And we're going to, we're going to bring him back in our arms, and we're going to hold him up, and we're going to say, look, 'Look, we've got him. He's here.' Mm. And they and they searched for days, and they found nothing. And and people say, well, the police. You know, they mucked it up. They did this or that wrong. And I think, well, do you really think the police didn't want to find him? Of course they did. Of course they still do. They still do, eight years on. Um, his family desperately need to know. I mean, some people say to me, well, you know, maybe he was taken by a, a snatcher who, who put him 
you know, like snatched to order by a family who wanted a baby who couldn't have a baby. And I think, well, that's not right. He still belongs with the people who, who love him, his family. He doesn't belong wherever he's been taken. And then there is the trauma of people who are involved in foster care as well, who've become closely associated with the case, who relive the trauma every day. It doesn't ever leave you. It doesn't, I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine what it might be like to live with the idea that your child is missing and you have no idea where they are? Mm. Uh, it's inconceivable to me. It is, and I think that the picture of William in his Spider-Man suit, you look at it and you just... I don't know, it breaks my heart every time he's so little and so sweet. And yeah, I just think it's um it's 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 the biggest child disappearance case since Daniel Morecambe. I mean, really, people are very invested in this, um, even if they, you know, don't have any connection to it. I think it just strikes at the heart of people. Um and, and that's a great thing, Emily, because I think what Stella and, and Catherine have both experienced in in researching their book and they've transmitted to the public very well is the idea that social change will come in the wake of these terrible crimes. I mean, Stella's talking about a time when women had no rights at all. I mean, there's a reason why 37 babies turned up in, in those circumstances. It was because women couldn't work and they had no way to make a living and they were subject to alcohol-based violence. And, and Catherine's telling a time as well in Melbourne in the 1930s, but the situation for women was very different. You, you, know, you, you still had to give up your job if you became pregnant or got married. And, and social change will come from the William Tyrrell case too. And it's important to me that people are invested in the case, that they care about him. It would be awful to think that they didn't. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone's hoping, hoping, hoping that he is found, you know. Of I mean, course. it's it's going to, you know, what happens? Um, I mean, do you, do you have any thoughts about, you said you think, it can definitely be solved. William's disappearance can be solved, but I guess as time goes on, it, it's it's unlikely that he will be found alive. I, I refuse to believe um, any of the theories that go around because there is no evidence that William is dead. And also I steadfastly believe that the, the crime will be solved because it wants to be solved. The all, all of, our, our, of our combined human knowledge over thousands of years tells us that the truth wants to be known. It wants to be known. It waits for us to find it, just as it has done in, in the books written by the two other women on this panel. The truth mm. will out for sure. Mm. And, and let's be ready when it does. It's very powerful. And, and it's, yeah, I, I, I believe too that, that the truth will come out about this case and I hope so much for the families. Um, Stella, what about you um, with your writing process in the case? What, what was something that has particularly stayed with you about what you've written about? Um, I don't know, it, it, how did it affect you writing about it? Because it's not easy to write about these things. I think because I was focused on the adults and, and the process and what happened before and after and so on. And because it was so long ago, I think I sort of had a distance there, plus probably some sort of professional ability to sort of turn things off in order to focus on the details. And the newspaper reports at the time, even though they were very sensational, most of the information I was reading was from court reports, which the courts are looking for facts rather than emotional content. So that helped. I think what stuck with me most was just how different Perth was in 1907 than I'd actually imagined it was. I'd seen pictures of Perth and it looked quite civilised and it was um, rather a veneer really and there was very few paved streets. There was no sewage system. There was the whole social situation of single women, as we've mentioned before. And, um, the idea that women gained value by staying home, raising a family. I think Harriet Lenahan sort of stuck with me because she was a, a single woman who was independent and copped a lot of flack because she was a, an independent single woman. But also the strangeness of the fact that she moved from being a music teacher to being a health inspector and then went on to something quite different again afterwards. It's, she was an unusual character. 
Yeah, it's good to, I, I love to learn about women who broke the molds. And it's funny today, I mean, we, we can do what we want. And then there's criticism, like if you stay home and raise a family, there's criticism if you work, you know, it's like we can never catch a break. That's how it feels mm. all the time. Um, Catherine, what about you? With um, You mentioned um, very strongly that you wanted the girls to be known. Um, it was very important for you for their story to be told. What was um, it like for you um, writing this book? I mean, I've spoken to other authors who've written true crime who, you know, it really impacts them. Um, you know, I've spoken to someone who had quite strong nightmares about the very harrowing cases she was writing about. What was it like for you with your writing and, and really delving into this case? I found um, certainly with the, the research, there were points where I, I just had to stop and put it aside and walk away because it was uh, just to give myself the space to process what I was reading about. Um, and even some of the, the peripheral cases, because I was looking at crimes that, had, you know, that led into this potentially with other criminals. And one of the files that I opened in um, public record office, which I actually had to get them to cut the knots on because the case had just not been looked at since about 1928. And in that was a, there was an envelope buried in the middle of this real stack of papers. And in the envelope was uh, a pathology slide and a gauze swab. And this was a swab that had been taken from a little 12 year old girl um, who had potentially been sexually assaulted in 1928. And it was buried in the middle of this file. And I, I just, I had to stop working at the, the public records office that day because that, it just, it made it so, so much more immediate than being 1928 and being, you know, almost a hundred years ago. But it was also, as Caroline said, it was, it was the broken families that I think that really, really brought home to you the impact the wider impact this had on the communities, um, just the, the little moments of, the little moments sounds so wrong, but to, to read about, um, you know, a, mother's, a mother breaking down in court, um, an incredible letter that the father of one of the victims wrote to the local newspaper in, in regional Victoria, thanking the community for helping to search for his little six-year-old girl, thanking the other families for rallying around his wife, thanking the funeral director for the job he'd done in the hardest of circumstances. And it was just the most beautiful and heartfelt and gut-wrenching letter at the same time. And then the killer's wife, um, some letters that she'd written just after he'd been arrested. And this poor woman, another broken family, she was completely blindsided. They had an eight-year-old daughter of their own and she wrote this letter to him when he was first arrested and said, well, look, I'm, I'm putting together money. I've got our savings. I've, our friends are ready to chip in, but I need to know. Please tell me that you didn't do the things that everyone's saying you did. And she was she was begging with. She said, "What if this was our girl? You, how she? You could just every every word. You could just see that she could not reconcile the idea of what people were saying this man had done with the man she'd married and who was obviously a doting father to his own little girl." And yet the moment she learnt the truth, she immediately severed all ties, changed her name, rebuilt her life with her daughter. And the, the strength of that woman in that situation just completely blew me away. So there were so many more people that, that, just, that you just sort of had to take into your heart when you were writing this and, and carry them with you and remember that this was part of their story too and to, to try and and do them justice as well. Yeah, I think that's very poignant. And it's a poignant point, I think, to um, wind up our chat chat tonight. Um, it's a lot to think about, you know, um, especially writing about true crime, but also writing about it when there's children who are victims. And I guess one last question I want to ask is about the changes that, you know, have happened over the years in child protection but what but children still are, are victims of crime they're still killed they're still not looked after they're still um terribly hurt i guess i want to finish with what 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 is the answer this is a very big question and there's probably no answer but caroline what 
what do you think? You know, you've been a journalist for a long time. You've covered a lot of different cases. What are your views about child safety and protection? You know, I think that's such an interesting question because it varies so much. I mean, there are so many cases that I have covered over the years where you cannot believe the, the, the anger and the ferocity and the violence and the cruelty brought upon children, child victims of crime. I mean, just this year we had um, the inquest into to Jack and Jennifer Edwards who were shot dead by their own father in a, in a custody dispute. And it boggles the mind that you would do that to children. Of course, I understand that he was trying to punish their mother and you do that by taking away the thing that she loves the most. But there are also cases like that of William Tyrrell where you couldn't find a boy more loved. You couldn't find a boy more loved. And a random act of cruelty like this to be brought upon him and the suffering that people have to endure as a result is uh, it's beyond my ability to understand it, Emily. Mm. Stella, you've got a, a professional background, you know, you're, you're in the medical field and, you know, I'm interested to know what your view is on it, you know, both from working um, with writing this book, but also from your professional background, what's your thoughts about child safety and protection and what, you know, what, what's the answer to like protecting children? Well, I think, as I said, legislation is only as good as the people who actually put it into practice. So, um, having people willing to, to say something if they see something is really important. And I, I, I haven't worked with children very much, but while I was in practice, it became law that if a, a doctor suspected that there was any child abuse going on, they had to report it, which I think was a, a positive step because it is so easy to say, well, maybe somebody else should deal with this or maybe it's not really happening mm -hmm. so encouraging people to to actually say something if they do have suspicions is i mean that, that's not going to solve every problem but i think it would will help mm, yeah thanks it's um i remember when um i was you know a teenager when there was a case in um, melbourne a little boy called daniel valerio and he was terribly abused shocking and he and he and he died and um, there was many, many opportunities for people to speak up that, and, and, it, and that's when mandatory reporting came in. And yeah, mm. that, that to me, I just remember the newspaper um, front page of this poor little boy with, yeah, terrible injuries and, and that really stays with me. Um, and I've got an interest in this area. I just think it's, um, and it doesn't matter if you're a parent or not, does it? It's just about, no. you know, decent humanity. Catherine, what about you? Um, what's your thoughts about this? Well, I think certainly the difference between the way society thought in the 1930s in terms of children being allowed out to play, you know, with, without any supervision and, and it's changed a great deal. The way we approach looking after our children, which but sadly that's probably a reflection of the way society has changed and perhaps become more of a more of a dangerous place for children as well. The other thing that I noticed is that they had no hesitation in putting small children on the stand in the courtroom as witnesses mm -hmm. at that stage. And so asking these children and in fact having them in to um, identify people in a police lineup. So before the days of two-way glass, bringing a small child in, putting her in front of a, a lineup of, of thugs and saying, can you pick out the man who abducted and killed your sister to a seven-year-old girl? So I think there are, you know, there's no way anything like that would, would, you know, be conceived of today, let alone putting a child on the stand and saying, do you know what happens if you lie once you've sworn on the Bible and having this poor little girl in floods of tears saying, I'm not going to go to heaven, you know, just, almost breaking children like that. So we're, we're much more aware of the needs of children in that sense and, and not putting them in, in, in these mentally dangerous places, protecting them better in that way. But I think as a society, we, we still have a lot to do in the terms of the way we, the way we protect and the things, well, as Stella said, legislation can only go so far. Um, but but it's, many things have changed, but at the same time, many things have stayed the same which is really sad to say. Mm. Well, it's been a really interesting discussion, ladies, and I'm really, really privileged to have been able to talk to you. Um, we we've come to the end of the discussion, but 
sisters in crime um, events can only happen with the support of people who book the events and we've got some um, books to say thank you to people who have booked and supported us with some donations to keep us going we do lots of events um, like this and we'll get back to in-person events soon hopefully so we're going to choose three um, three people who've supported us um, and they've gone into the draw for three packs of crime books. Um, they're each worth $150, including books by the panellists um, tonight. So I'm going to ask um, each of you to choose a number between one and 50 and that will determine who's the winner. So Caroline, I'm going to ask you for your lucky number. I'll say number two because I have twins. Well, number two is Jen Hutchin Hutchison. Congratulations, Jen. And thank you very much for supporting this event. Um, Catherine, what about you? 36. 36. Okay. 36 is Sandy Curtis. Congratulations, Sandy. Thanks for supporting the event tonight. And Stella, what's your lucky number? 18. 18. Um, number 18 is Tracy Mackay. You will receive a book pack. So thanks very much for supporting the event tonight, Tracy. You can buy all the author's books here tonight from Sisters in Crime, long-term supporter, The Sun Bookshop, which now has an online service. On Sisters in Crime's YouTube channel, you will find other events plus um, Murder Monday interviews with both Australian and overseas crime fiction authors, including Val McDermott, Kathy Reichs, Sarah Paretsky and Anne Cleves. You can keep in touch with Sisters in Crime through the website and you can sign up for the monthly newsletter, A Stab in the Dark, or better still, you can join up and be a sister. And they also accept Brothers in Crime too. You can also follow Sisters in Crime on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Thanks to everyone um, who's watching and thanks to our panellists, Caroline, Catherine and Stella. Stay strong, stay safe and keep reading. Thanks. Good night.